G'day everyone and welcome back to the shed. While you guys have been gone, I've been pretty busy. I've got the engine back in and I've got everything connected up and it actually runs and drives around at the moment. So today I'm going to get the dash pulled apart and we'll get this airbag out of the dash and replace that. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to take the opportunity to pull all the air conditioning out and give it a good clean inside. Now, with cars that don't have cabin filters in them and the air that gets sucked into the air conditioner is just drawn from outside the car, over time the evaporator inside gets clogged up with dust and little bits of leaves and all sorts of things, lint from out of the car and out of our clothing and things like that. So any opportunity we have that we've got the dash apart, it's worthwhile actually pulling that evaporator out and the heater core and give it all a good clean out. And any of you living in Australia will know how important it is to have air conditioning in our cars and we would like them to be icy cold. So putting the engine back in, relatively straightforward, just the reverse of pulling it apart. I've replaced all of the power steering hoses. Uh, one of them was actually broken in the accident, but the rest of them, the car's nearly 20 years old. It's done nearly 300,000 kilometres, so they're all a bit secondhand and old. When I first bought the car, roughly 100,000 kilometres ago, I put all new heater hoses on, radiator hoses and things like that. And with this accident, I have replaced the bottom radiator hose because that one was all scrunched in and it had been pinched by the bottom of the radiator. So that one was a pretty high risk candidate for actually blowing and causing a problem on the road. The other thing I've done is replace all the flexible brake hoses. And it's one of my big bugbears with older cars, and by older I mean anything that's over 10 years old, is the flexible brake hoses tend to get stiff, they get hard, and the material inside them where the brake fluid's in there actually degenerates with age and it can cause blockages and things like that. So once again, car's nearly 20 years old, I've chosen to put all new hoses on it and because we had all the brakes apart anyway it was no extra work because they all had to come apart to pull the car apart and we had to bleed the brakes anyway. So that's done. So before you get into any sort of dash repair, removal, part replacement, working on it, the first job is always to disconnect the battery. And it might seem like a bit of a no-brainer, but I've seen plenty of guys and experienced guys in the trade that have started working on a car dash and all of a sudden there's smoke coming out from underneath the dash because they've put a screwdriver or a spanner in the wrong spot, it's shorted something out and suddenly there's wires melting. So protect yourself, always disconnect the battery first. And when we disconnect the battery, we always start by disconnecting the ground lead. And there's a very simple reason for that and I'll show you why. Now, one terminal is always going to be the ground, and for most cars out there and everything in this era, it's going to be the negative post. And it's the wire that goes down and it's connected to the frame of the car. Here's our live terminal on this car, and it's the positive one. And if we start by removing this one first, and we've got a car that's got the battery into a cavity, and you can imagine on this car if the posts were reversed here, and we had the live post near the edge of the car, and we start undoing it with a metal spanner, and it contacts something metal on the car, we can have a short circuit. But if we start by disconnecting the ground terminal first, and we happen to touch the car, it's the same potential. Like this is the ground terminal, it's the same as the car frame everywhere. So there's going to be no short circuit, no sparks, no damage to anything. So once that's disconnected, it doesn't matter what we touch here, there's no circuit through there. So always start by disconnecting the ground terminal first. 99% of the time, it's going to be the negative post. And pretty much anything built with an alternator on it from factory is going to have the negative post as the ground down to the frame of the car. But if you have got an English car made up until about 1970, they usually have got positive ground. So just be wary of that if you're starting to work on your old car and all the old side valve Fords, they were always positive ground as well. So just something to be aware of. Now, check, because a lot of these cars have been converted over the years, and we used to do that back in the day, particularly in the 70s and 80s, when there was a lot of this stuff still driving around, and I'm talking about the English cars here. You couldn't buy positive ground radios. To put a modern stereo for the era into a 1960s, English car, we did a lot of conversions and we converted a lot of them around to negative ground. And it was a simple little job. I'm not going to worry about going into it today because I don't have a car to explain with it. But if you've got one of these cars, just check before you start disconnecting your battery and make sure you are unhooking the right wire. Stay safe, guys. Don't go killing your spanners or your car. 
Car batteries contain acid, guys. If you're handling terminals and batteries themselves, always wash your hands. Don't go wiping your hands on your clothes because battery acid just loves eating clothing and things like that. And even if you get back in the car and touching the upholstery and things like that and you've got a bit of residual battery acid on your hands, you can cause problems like that. But if it is there, you'll notice it pretty quick. It'll start to tingle a bit to start with and then it'll hurt. I'm about to go and wash my hands. Now the steering column's got to come out on this car to get the dash out and I don't really want to play this as a step-by-step -step set of instructions on how to take the dash out of a Commodore. I'm just going to keep it rather generic and share some of the things I've learned over the years and my trade is auto electric so I've had hundreds of dashes out of all different sorts of cars and usually without any prior training or workshop manuals it's just a case of you start looking for bolts and bits and pieces and screws and work your way down and we only really need the fascia off on this so all this across here and we can get the airbag out and that opens everything up all the aircon is just sitting basically straight out in the open once all this has gone out the way and there's probably quicker ways to get it out and if you were in a dealership situation where you were working on these cars all the time you would know all the shortcuts but most of us are going to be coming to it blind and working our way in so the clock spring for the airbag which i'll show you once we get it apart is hiding in the top of the column it's got to get replaced anyway so the steering wheel's got to come off and interestingly with holden's repair procedure they do say to replace the steering wheel on this model and replace the steering column and the clock spring and a lot of other bits and pieces as well but interesting Later in time, the newer models, they said inspect for damage and replace if necessary. So I'm thinking when this car came out, airbags were still a little bit ooh, new and exciting and pretty scary to the trade and to the manufacturers as well. And so they were just looking after themselves and sort of saying, just replace it and um, don't run the risk. So this one's got the leather steering wheel and it's in good condition and they're a bit hard to find. And I will give this one a good inspection. And if I can't see any damage to it, I will be putting the steering wheel back in. I do have other steering columns, so it's one of those things. I don't think it needs replacing because it's a collapsible column, so it'll collapse from the impact of the car, but it also is adjustable, so you've just got this in and out. So if you look at the impact of an airbag going off like this, anything, any energy that's got to go somewhere should just close the steering column up a bit, so it shouldn't actually cause any damage. But we do have other ones, so we can swap that over pretty easy. With clock spring cars, and actually I'll grab it and I'll show you, just wait there. Here's the clock spring, and they call them a clock spring because it's just got like a big spring wound up inside there. And there's a little printed circuit on this spring that carries the electrical signal across from the steering wheel controls for the horn, for the radio controls, and for the airbag. So that's the electrical connector in there. That fits in behind the steering wheel and then we've got the connectors that's the airbag one there and this one does the horn and the stereo controls now when they're off the car they've got a little lock on them which will lock them in the straight ahead position if we take the steering wheel off and our front wheels are not straight ahead we can have the clock spring off center and we can pull the wheel off and it locks in this straight ahead position but it might already be wound to the right or to the left when we take the wheel off we go to put it back together sometime later and the car's been moved, the wheels have been straightened up. We've got a clock spring that's going to fail because it's not in the straight ahead position. So best advice for anything like this, make sure the wheels are straight ahead before you start taking the steering wheel off and that way we know the clock spring's going to be good. Now this car had a new clock spring fitted to it not that long ago. They do fail, the little circuit breaks inside them and then things stop working. So you can come up with an airbag fault or one of the controls in there won't work. And so you replace the clock spring, that comes good. What actually happened when the airbag went off was it actually melted the plug into the back of the airbag. So that killed that and I had to cut the wire off to actually get it apart. That wire just plugs on there, that comes off here. We can take that off. GMH says to replace it. Um, I want to test it electrically. If it still turns and the electrical circuits still work in there, I can't see any reason why that has failed. The only thing that I can think of was if the charge that goes through the clock spring is 
quite a high current, it could melt the little clock spring inside, but we'll pick that up by testing it electrically. So that one may still be all right, um, possibly it's dead, but if not, I've got a replacement second hand one and we can put that in it. So we'll get the wheel off. Now naturally, if you're doing something for the first time, a workshop manual for your particular car is going to be a handy thing to know the procedures. When I was growing up, I worked a lot in my dad's workshop and so he often brags that I had one of the longest apprenticeships in history because my whole time I was a toddler until I was a teenager, I was in his shed and he was showing me how to do things, but he had an unusual teaching method and it's always stuck with me and I'd ask him how something worked and he'd say, pull it apart and work it out for yourself. So this is my approach to a lot of things. If it's a car that I've never had apart before, you pull it apart and work it out for yourself. Thanks, Dad. Now this clock spring is not locking in the straight ahead position. So it could be what GMH says that they are a throwaway. It has died. They've got these little legs in here. But there you go. No, this doesn't want to lock. When they're spread, they hold it straight out. And when the steering wheel goes on, they just push in through there and they tighten that up. And then the whole spring can turn. Yeah, we're always going to have a heap of Phillips screws lurking within your car. Now, I've had this to bits before, but it just pulls off. Some of them can be a bit tricky to find. That pulls off, that's easy. It feels like it's going to screw there, but it doesn't want to. Here's one. When you take a screw out of a spot, just visualise it a little bit and get a look at what it looks like. And most of them are going to be very similar screws throughout the whole dash structure. And that one's gone down there, we'll have to get him in a bit. But if you've got an odd bod one, it pays to mark it or put it aside somewhere where you can grab it later for it going back together. And today with mobile phones, just take a photo of the screw and where it lives. And that way we know we're gonna get it back in the right spot. That just pulls off there. Accumulated dust, we'll give that a good clean before it goes back together. The big trick is working out how to unlock the little clips on the plugs. There will always be some sort of a little latch that's got to be pushed in or moved to get them apart. Most of them are going to be very obvious. The clock spring ones are usually a bit tricky. And even though I've had it apart, it was a few years ago now. I'm going to have to work it out again. Here's a situation where we've got a special screw for a special spot, that's the earth white one, but I'll just screw him back in loosely. Now the wire's off. Okay. What holds you on?
I have no idea how that works. If there's a brightly coloured piece of plastic in an electrical connector, it's usually a lock. There it is there. So that one pushed in and then pulled across. So there we go. So this is the second hand one I got that I thought would go in, but it's out of the next model. And they don't interchange. So we're going to have to find one of these from somewhere. And bragging about the wires coming apart. Doesn't look like they do that either, it's all moulded in there. So that's dead and we're going to get a new one of them. Now everywhere you're going to find little cable ties tied around the harness and they've got a little base on them that locks into a hole in brackets and all sorts of things. And if you squeeze the two little legs in on the little plastic cable tie edge, they will come out. This one here doesn't want to play the game. Usually without killing them. There we go, he's out. So that'll just pop back in again. So that's the little legs either side there and it's just a matter of squeezing them in and when it goes back together it just pushes through the hole and the legs pop out to hold it all in place. Simple as. Usually there'll be a couple of screws hiding somewhere in here and there's one there and there's one there. Nothing down there. Now these can be a bit weird in some cars. Some of them are just clipped in as well. So, and some of them just clip into the fascia. And they're the ones I hate the most because you've got to get something around the edge to sort of pop them out. That's what it's called, that's its name. Can you remember that? <laughs> This one's pretty friendly, so it's just got a couple of little hooks on the bottom that hook it into the bottom of the crash pad there. A couple of clips on the side and the two screws, so it's pretty easy. We can even remember how to put that back together. Now, the instrument cluster should come out. Now we need to have that out because I'm not sure if... Yeah, it looks like this goes with it, the frame for it, and there'll be wiring on the back that we'll have to unhook. So sometimes we can get away with it and leave the instrument cluster in a dash pad, but you've always got to get the wires off it. And what have we got? Another two screws. These little fellas in here, it's almost like a little rack and pinion, these clips. You've got a little latch that'll be hooked onto a little clip there you've got to push down and then lift the latch out. And they're pretty common with stuff around this age. And you pull that handle up and it'll walk the plug out. Now the big row of bolts across the top here which will hold the top of the assembly in but before we get that far, we'll start undoing screws. And once we know we've got enough undone, it'll start moving and falling away. So there's one down the side here. 
another joy of cars of this age. A bit sun attacked and a bit brittle. I just had a big heap of plastic just snap off the end of the switch. I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, sucks out of it. That's vacuum control switch, that one there. But there, there's the end all broken out of that. So that could have even happened from the car being an impact, just the jar on the front of the car. But I'd say it's just age, sun attacked. Oh. Lucky I have a few spares. Okay, that all comes together. Looks like driver's side is nearly, 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 let's see. Oh, there's a screw right near somewhere. Just if you just give them a little gentle bit of a movement, we can see it's flexing back to this point. There's a bracket there with two screws into it, but that's usually how I go about pulling them apart. It's just keep seeing what moves and what doesn't. Okay, that's free through to there. This one here. The door and the pillar are just sort of, you can't get a screwdriver in there on the right angle. And this is right on the edge of what's going to work because of the angle that's got him, he's in. And it's loose. Need to be a bit wary here because it doesn't take much of a whop on that to break a screen. Five bolts, so I'll take them all out and leave the one in the middle for the last one. Still something over here though. Let's have another look on the other side. That's why you don't give them a big reef and see what happens. Gentle little pulling motions on them, and if they move easy. You're on the right track. If they don't want to move, don't force them. Haha. <laughs> Otherwise, there will be tears. Old mate years ago in these situations would refer to it as torn party dress and tears. But let's not have that today. And look at that. It's out. Play for trying to get the airbag out with the dash pad in, so the bolts are already off. Just got to work out what's left holding it in. Looks like this rail here is going to have to come out. It's still trapped. Okay. Here's a little observation I've noticed. Hold them up to point them out. This is one of the screws from across the bottom of the windscreen there for holding the dash in. It's got a little rubber washer on it. And the other ones, although they're the same bolt, that hold all this bracketry together, has, doesn't have the washer on it. So when we go back together, we've got to remember there's five of these to go around the base of the windscreen. And that makes sense because that's bolting a plastic dash together. So. Okay. Screw hiding in there. Take this out. Experiment is in order. No, that doesn't come out either. Looks like it's working our way down to it.
got him. That's got him. Right. Now we don't want to damage the wiring into the car. So how do you work? It's a little latch. There we go. So that's the little spring-loaded latch. I said to push him in. Right, so that's the beast. It's out. So he's gone. Now yeah, we've got to get this fella out. That's the next little chore. Yeah, given there's all this dust in here, I'm guessing the evaporator's going to have a fair bit of dust in it as well. So. Well worth pulling it out and giving the whole car a freshen up. It's just a big jigsaw puzzle. And thing is, we're learning how to put it back together by taking it apart, aren't we? Uh. That's all going to have to come off there, because this will all come out as one piece. That piece will come off. He's not doing much. I've just got to get this whole assembly here. It comes out in one bit. But this is still in the way. So there's a bolt in there, and it's attached over here. So I'll get them out, and that bracket out the way. And then it's just going to be a matter of getting the wires unhooked. I've got these over here out the way. And that'll allow the box to come out. And the bolts are in the engine compartment, so they, they bolt through the firewall and then it's just got the air conditioner pipes go through and the heater pipes go through. And there's probably going to be a vacuum hose as well I would say, for the vacuum controls. the sensor for the GPS and the radio, so that can stay with that. Yeah, I might just split this one. This one's the body um, vehicle interface to the engine computer. Let me just get him out the way. TX valve's going to have to come off, and there's one of the bolts holding it on. There's another one in there, another one beside it, and another one on the other side. So there's only the four of them, I think. And the heater pipes are already disconnected, so that'll go straight through there and come out. That's the vacuum line feeding vacuum into the dash taps, and here's where it comes back out to work the heater tap, which is hiding way down there. Okay, so. This is the, really the brain of the air conditioner. This is a little orifice in there that's continually changing size to regulate how much um, liquid passes through and gets turned into a gas as it goes past that point because it just relies on a rapid expansion of pressure change in there. And when the gas turn, well, when the liquid turns to a gas, it gets very cold at the same time. So very important part. And if it don't work, your car don't get cold.
and it's out. That's the beast. We've got a seal that's stuck onto the car and tearing. You can go back there. Well, not be that bad. Water leaking out. Not a lot of dust in that piece. Anyway, we'll pull it to bits and find out. The bit we want is in here, so usually it's a case of splitting the case. But we'll get rid of all this dust anyway, we'll get it all pulled to bits. Well, that's got some of the loose dust off it. A lot of years of accumulation over it. And um, we will get it all apart and give it a wash before we go back together though, so that'll be all good. Now, I like to sit and have a look at these heater boxes, aircon boxes, before I get too involved in them and just see what's the best plan of attack. So that's our heaters there. That one just lifts out. And it's got foam padding all the way around it that's disintegrated with age, so we'll have to replace that before we go back together. But we've got a little linkage in here that works some doors, and that looks like it's got to come off. And here are the pipes for the air conditioner evaporator, and it's hiding down in here, so we've got to dig down into it from there. So, like most things, if you're not familiar with them, take a few photographs so you've got a little bit of a view of how it looks to go back together again. And once again, I don't really want to make this as a step-by-step -step thing for a VY Commodore. We'll just keep it all very general and you can apply this to any other sort of car. This one looks like it's all pretty much screwed together. A lot of the 1980s sort of stuff had a lot of little metal clips holding it together. And they were common in the 70s and things like that and they work well too. Just don't lose them because they're hard to find now and short of getting another car for spare parts or something like that. So we'll start pulling a few bits and pieces off and see what we come up with. So I'll get this linkage out the way to start with and then we can move on to getting it apart. And once again, if you find an odd looking screw that looks a bit special, it pays to keep it with the pieces it belongs to. And often, it looks like we're right here today, with little things like this, there could be a little washer, anti-rattle thing that fits in between there that might want to fall out. But this one's got one, it's a moulded rubber one, but it looks like it pushes quite firmly onto the little post. So. There's going to be a heap of screws to undo. Pretty complicated piece. Someone had to sit down and design all this to make it fit into the space in the dash and have it do all the things it's supposed to do. They did a good job, they worked quite well. There's a door there. Okay, that goes up there. Now, evaporator cores are something that need a bit of attention from time to time. So most cars, they are made to be able to be removed fairly easily. And the hardest part is usually getting the whole assembly out of the dash. So. Means from here on in, it's an easy run. Uh,
Just tuck that over there, keep it out of our way. Usually they're just sandwiched in there with the plastic case. That's got him, he's out. And look at that. This is what makes it well worth doing. That face is just about solid with grunge and grime and things like that. So this air conditioner was working, it was getting the car cool, but it's only got the space of a utility cabin, so it's not very big. So once we get this cleaned out and put it back together again, that's gonna work brilliantly well. Can't wait. Well, that's one of the worst ones I've ever seen, actually. As far as being blocked up. It was due for a birthday. Yeah. Now, you'll have... Most cars are going to have a little block where there's a bunch of wires going into the side of the box. And that is the little rheostat or resistor for the fan speeds. So what they actually have is a little reducing resistor that will drop the voltage down to the fan motor so it'll run at slower speeds and then it bypasses for the faster speeds. Now, in old cars, which we're all familiar with and love, there's little curly bits of wire inside these. This is a modern high-tech one with a big heat sink on it and so there's probably some circuitry in there to do the same job little men and mirrors department but pays to take them out early in the piece and put them aside so they don't get damaged okay. now once we get the fan motor out this one's a plastic box, although older cars will have fiberglass ones, but once you've got the electrical parts out and the things that could get damaged with water, there's no reason why we can't just go and get the hose and give this a good blast with the hose and squirt as much of the dirt and rubbish out of it that way. And then once it's dried out, we can clean off these dead foams and put some new ones of those on and we'll be well on the way to having our box sorted. Now, with this project, it is just a repair rather than a restoration, so I'm not going to perfect it. I just want it to be back to working in the way it was originally designed to and all nice and clean and fresh inside. If you've got a bad smell coming from your heaters or air conditioning, it'll be coming from within this box usually. And over the years, I've had cars where people have brought them to me and they'll have had a dead mouse in the car somewhere and usually they die in the most obscure places somewhere within all of this stuff and you've got to spend a day pulling half the car apart to get the dead mouse out and, and the smell that goes with it. Another one hiding down there. Same thing as before with the pulling the dash out. If it doesn't want to come out easily, don't force it. There will usually be another screw hiding somewhere that's just lurking in there and wanting to be a problem. Just working my way around, picking off all the covers I can to get it as open as possible. Now, this is a good time to get some photos where these vacuum hoses go before you go pulling them off like I've just done there and forgetting where they all went. Could be kind of cool though, put them all on in the wrong spots and then the control on the dash says windscreen and it's really blowing in your face or something like that. And be good for when you let other people borrow your car. 
I'd do things like that. I would say that bit is probably as far apart as we need it. So we can give that a good wash out now, get him all cleaned up, and then get into it. What we might do is just grab a little brush and give this bit of a rub, a bit of an air hose blow to start with, I think. Big thing with aircon is moisture is your big enemy here. It might be tempting to get out and give this a good wash, which Sometimes it might be your only resort, but if you do that, make sure you've got it well and truly blocked off. Because if you get any moisture inside it, then you're going to have major problems and failures of components in the future. spent the last few hours getting all this cleaned up and it's not clean to perfection to restoration standards it's sort of back to everyday driver so there's still gravel dust sort of hiding in all these little corners and bits and pieces like that but that's not going to affect the way it runs or works and things like that now I've been getting the heater core ready to go back in and replacing the foam tape around it and I've just gone to the hardware store and bought some stuff to go on there now this adhesive foam strip comes in two types. Now this nice soft squishy stuff is open celled and the more solid, I can't see it, this stuff here is closed cell. So if you're looking for replacement stuff, the stuff that looks a bit more like a sheet of rubber is closed cell and then all this nice squishy stuff like seat foams and things like that is open celled stuff. So important to know and match them up same for same when you're going back together because you could have a few air leaks and bits and pieces. And I've had a little trial fit with this before and it's got gaps around the corners and I'm guessing the original foam must have been a bit more substantial than what I've been able to buy just easily locally. So what I've done is just doubling up the ends to try and pack these corners up because with any air conditioning system, heater system that's in underneath the dash of the car, any spots where the air wants to leak out into the cavity behind the dash, it's less air that's going to blow out at you. And so quite often you can have air bypassing which hasn't been through the heater or hasn't been through the aircon evaporator and you're going to find that that'll be cold when you want it hot and hot when you want it cold. So it pays to just check all these things and make sure you've got all these little spots sealed up and go from there. I'll put this last piece of tape on and then we can drop this one in and then we'll put the evaporator back in as well. But while before we get there, have a bit of a look at the evaporator, I've given it a good clean up. As you saw before, I was blowing it all out with the air. Since then, I did actually bite the bullet and go and wash it. And what I did was I got a bucket of soapy water and keeping the pipes well out the way because moisture is the killer of air conditioners. I slushed it up and down and got it all fluffed up with a lot of soap going through it and then I put the hose on it and it has come up as clean as you are going to get it so there's no particles of dirt stuck between the fins so this will go back to working as a new one once we put it back together so that was well worth the exercise and that just drops into the box there's no well it's got a couple of bits of closed cell foam on the ends of it and they're fine there's nothing wrong with those so that can go back in now Got a little rubber seal I'll have to hook into the box but I'll do that in a minute and we get this other one in there and then I'll just put it all back together and get it back in the car and I will be back to cleaning again because naturally the car's going to have to be cleaned it's got as much dust in there underneath the dash as what this had and then we'll probably come back to this repair once we've got it all in the car and ready to start putting the dash together
because this stuff's so pliable I'm not worried about it doubled up there it'll actually just push into the box and just make a little bit better seal this piece just drops in there it's pretty much just gravity holding it in the box this little bracket down the bottom clamps it in place but there's nothing in particular apart from the formed pipes that hold it in place Well, that's all tucked in there nicely, so I can't see that causing us any problems in the future at all. I've got all the heaters and aircon back in the car now, and it's a very easy process. You've just basically got to put it roughly in the right spot, slide it forward until the pipes for the air conditioning and the heaters actually contact the firewall little bit of a wriggle they'll go through their holes and poke out into the engine bay and then there was a couple of bolts that I could get to from the inside to get it started hang in place and then I got out into the engine bay and just put the four bolts through that were through there from the other side and it's all done tightened it all up it's in place so then it's just a case of putting the wires back in around it a few brackets and bits and pieces and there's our replacement airbag back inside and if we slide the cover aside a bit we can see the little parachute airbag all folded up in there ready to deploy if it's needed. I've got a little electrical repair to do and this is for a little speaker that sits up on the corner of the dash and I'm guessing when the car's been apart before and had the airbags replaced in it once before they couldn't get the speaker off to get the wiring undone and the little wiring plug sits down beside the speaker against the edge of this door pillar and it's very hard to get it unplugged with the speaker attached to the dash and to get the dash out you really need the speaker off but the screw's hard to get out, the angle of the windscreen makes it very difficult to undo the screw and for some reason they seem to bind in these ones and the car I took the replacement dash out of I had the same problem I just couldn't get those screws loose and you do run the risk of damaging things getting it apart with them on there but in the end I did manage to get one speaker off one end on this car and the same on the other car so they came out and I was able to do the other speaker with the dash out of the car but in the past I'm guessing they reached the point where time is money and they've chopped the wire off to do it and then they've just forgotten to reconnect an end onto it when they put it back together. So what I've done, most modern-ish cars only give you just enough wire to do the job. So I've cut the plug out of one of the dead cars I've got and given myself enough wire to join it and keep the plug at the same length it used to be. Now many people watching this might be surprised to learn that this is my trade. I'm an auto electrician by trade. All of the panel works and paint works and things like that I've taught myself as I've gone along so I should know how to do this part of it now when it comes to skinning wires I like to just grab my side cutters give it a little bit of a squeeze one way turn it to 90 degrees another little bit of a squeeze on the insulation give it a pull and it just bears the wires just like that the other thing I like to do is where I'm joining multiple wires that are going to be taped together is to stagger the joins and that's so when we put it together if the insulation on an individual wire is damaged at all there's no way that we can have a short circuit because we've got the good piece of insulation back here near the join so that's what we're doing today we're going to use a little bit of heat shrink on them now heat shrink is not all created equal the really good stuff is referred to as dual wall tubing and it's a bit beefier in the wall section than the run of the mill heat shrink is and it's also got glue on the inside of it so when you heat it up the glue melts and it actually bonds it onto the insulation around it and onto your join so the big thing is to remember to slide the piece of heat shrink on your wire before you solder it together and um, sounds like a no-brainer but even I've done that more than once We'll leave it at more than once. So I've just twitched the wires together. I don't worry about twisting the wires up first. I'll just lay them side by side and then twist them around. Get them as tight as you can and as neat as you can because any pokey out parts are going to create little lumps and bumps and the um, solder's going to make a little pyramid on there and it could poke through the insulation and create a short circuit favorite weapon here is my scope soldering iron and these are referred to as instant heat they do take a little while to heat up but not long it's got a little carbon brush in the end of it you push this collar forward and it heats the end up and 
you hear all these stories about you put the solder on the wire, not on the soldering iron and things like that. Well, it all works. You need to know that the soldering iron's hot enough, so a little dab of solder on there, and if it melts straight away, it's hot enough, which it's doing there. And then the next big trick is, is to heat your wire, because the wire needs to be hot enough to take the solder. And once she's hot enough, the solder will flow onto it. Just like that. So that one's nicely soldered. Once it's cool enough that it's not going to be a problem, if you jump in too soon, you can actually fracture the little bit of solder on your joint and you'll create what's known as a dry joint, which can cause some electrical issues. And the smart thing's to slide the piece of heat shrink on before you skin the wires, but why start now with smart things? All right. I tend to do my second wire a little bit tight like that and then pull him out beside the other one to get them the same length and then roll the last of it into place. And at the end of it our two wires should sit together, they do. Switch the ends in, just like that. Now, soldering irons can be too hot as well. If they start going red, they are way well past the point of being soldery, solderable. And more importantly, the red hot copper end will actually alloy with the tin in the solder and it turns it to bronze. And then they don't solder very well at all with a bronze tip instead of a copper tip. Okay. And then we've just got to set our heat shrink. We need that roughly in the centre. Heat shrink will shrink by roughly two thirds of its size. So you need a bit of tubing that's appropriate for your size of your wire. Now you can see where the glue's melted on the end of there and come out, and that's bonded onto the insulation as well. So that's made a permanent repair. I'll put another little piece up here, and I'm just going to replace the piece of tape in here, slide that over the join, and then we'll shrink that one down as well. Just recycling the piece that came off it, because it's this nice cloth tape that matches the rest of the dash. And this is off the replacement piece of wire, so it'll be a little bit too long. Once we get down there, we can just trim it to size. And just where I've run the join there, I'll run a loop of plastic tape to hold it down there so that I can slide the heat shrink over the top. And that'll allow us to get it together. If we're lucky. That's where I could have done with a little bit bigger piece of heat shrink. But it will do the job. Good as a new one. All we've got left to do in here is slide the dash pad in there, 
And once I've got that in there, bolt it all in, put the little speakers back in place. And then it's just a matter of fitting up the instruments, the console and all the bits and pieces in there, the glove box, that can all go back together. And the only other thing left to do inside the car as far as our smash repair is, I've got to replace the module for the airbags, which fits down here onto the centre tunnel. And that's a second hand replacement one there. And this car's got seatbelt pre-tensioners in it as well. So they've been triggered as well. So that's the seatbelt stalk. And it actually runs down. These cables run down inside and around a little pulley at the bottom. And then there's a, another little charge in there with a piston on it, which actually, is, once it goes off, it shoots forward and then pulls this down to tighten the seatbelt up. They throw it away and replace them with re replacement ones. We're using second-hand ones. But given that airbags and seatbelt tensioners and things like that are all safety items, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we could still buy them, even though this car's almost 20 years old. Uh, manufacturers like to keep that sort of stuff around, just mainly from the safety impact sort of side. Now here's the original dash panel out of the car, and originally I'd hoped to reuse this, but when I looked at the back of it, the airbag's done quite a bit of damage in here and it's broken all these mounting points off where this cage fits in here that goes around the airbag. And it's really done quite a number on this metal cage as well. It's torn out down at the bottom and there's a little clip thing in here I'll show you a bit closer later on and it's damaged all that as well. So this really is rubbish bin material now and it was just lucky I had a replacement one out of another car. So this is a little clip in arrangement that the door locks into. It's damaged all of that. This screw down here is pulled around a bit. The whole cage is sort of flared out on the sides where the airbag's gone out. And we've got all this damage on the other side of it where it's broken the plastic. So here's our replacement dash and I've taken it apart to give it a good clean because it did come out of a derelict car. The car had a badly damaged windscreen and there was a lot of broken glass in this area as well and it was all in around where the airbag door is. So very important to get that sort of stuff out the way because let's face it, if this car's in another accident and the airbag goes off and the passenger gets peppered with all these little pieces of glass that are sitting stuck into the dash that's nothing to do with this car, well, a bit unfortunate, isn't it? Could hurt a bit. So we've got the door and it's got like a little clip-in latch along the bottom that just goes in between these metal fingers. And in the case of our old dash, it's torn all the mounting points off as well as the doors popped up with the airbag going through it. But it's done the job, like it saved the person inside the car from any great injury. So we can uh, put this back together now and it's ready to go in the car. So I'm not going to bore you with throwing all this back together. I'll get that done and we'll come back to it later on. I've got all our dash back together and I've got the airbags replaced in the car. Now when I put it together, I've used a second hand airbag module which fits down here under the console. And it's the right configuration for this car. And I've been told that you can't put second hand ones into other vehicles because there's a VIN number configuration mismatch that causes problems for them. But there's a lot of second hand ones for sale on the internet from wreckers and bits and pieces. Now, this module came with the car I cut up to get the front clip for the car, and I figured I've got it, it didn't cost me anything, I'll plug it in and see what happens. So I'll just read the codes on it, and if we just go, yes, we wanna have the codes, current codes, no codes are present. Just go back out of that, go into the history of codes. 161 configuration mismatch. So that is probably what I've been told by the VIN number mismatch. So what I'm going to do is just clear that code and we'll see what the car does. So we'll back out of that and back out of that and go down and clear the codes. Are you sure? Yes. Codes erased. If code persists, try again. Right there. Yes, to continue. So what have we got here? We've got the light out at the moment. And we've got, let's turn the key off. And we'll go back on again. And the SRS light's gone out. 
system okay. Well, that was easy. We'll just go back in and see what the historic codes say now and see if there's still anything there, but I would doubt it. So if we go um, into codes only, enter on that, current codes, no codes present, so we're back out of that. History codes, yes, no codes present. So it looks like we can get away with putting a second-hand module into a car, but I'll keep you updated once we get the car going and going. I'm on the road again. If we have a problem with it, we'll get back to you and let you know. So that's where we're at. Okay, guys, we'll catch you next time.